show sponsors, The Canola School, Corteva Enlist E3, and Adama Canada. While other sources of innovation run dry and fail to understand your needs, Adama is here to deliver. And we're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today. Hello and welcome to The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. Thank you all for joining us here uh, on the show. Great to see Jim joining us from the tractor out in Saskatchewan. Uh, Kevin, you are no longer incognito. Uh, I also got a new phone. It changed a couple things, but you apparently are now Kevin. You are no longer Canadian cowman. You always will be in our hearts, Kevin. Absolutely. Okay, great show lined up for you. Uh, for you tonight, of course, if you collect those CEU credits, head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow morning. Let us know you took in the show and we'll get you those CEU credits. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, I got to tell you, it is pretty exciting to see Harvest sort of hitting full stride. We're a little behind here in Ontario, uh, but working on getting some of these uh, warm days through. I'm sure one of our guests tonight will have plenty to say about that. Uh, and planning the next few weeks of The Agronomist. So I've got a couple really good ones lined up and just love hearing from everybody. Um, in that I've got some really great feedback in the last little while about some things they'd like to see covered on the show. So by all means, you can always uh, zip me a message if you've got a particular topic or person uh, that you'd like to see on the show, let me know because it's always great uh, to cover some things. All right, uh, Ray has entered the chat. Looks like uh, real agriculture there too. Yes, let's kill some weeds. All right, let's bring in our guest for tonight. We're talking fall weed control with Rob Miller with BASF and Patty Saladuka with Adama Canada. Welcome here, Rob and Patty. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having us. All right. I feel like I moved my camera, but I didn't. Anyway, okay. Uh, Patty, let's start with you. First time on The Agronomist, so welcome here. Lovely to have you on. Uh, based in Saskatchewan, whereabouts are you based, and how are the crops looking where you are? Um, so I live just northwest of uh, Melfort. Um, the crops, we had a few rains when we needed them not like our normal bumper crops we're used to around here but um you know you just have to drive a couple hours out out from Melfort and you're very blessed with what we have here so um probably close to 60 65 70 percent um wrapped up harvest which is early for the northeast love it yep. yes all right uh jason vote out of southern manitoba said already doing some post-harvest burn down applications jump in the gun jason look out all right now rob you're based in uh, southern ontario thank you for taking time out of this is outdoor farm show this week so uh, are you, are you all week, yeah. yeah are you ready to roll yeah i think so i hope to make it there um maybe on thursday it's uh we we're hoping that it was actually going to be a, a nice sunny hot week at the farm show and we we're actually going to be sweating there but it doesn't look as much so um, no. we have a few fungicide evaluations to do so uh we'll and a, a few tours but hopefully uh, we can try and get there later this year or later this week so. rob is actually telling you he doesn't go in the rain which i don't blame you it gets very muddy and very yeah, muddy there yes um all right so but rob uh i did sort of allude to it in the open of course waiting on some beans waiting on some corn we we do get the sense that we're 10 to 12 days maybe more behind on maturity what are things looking like where you are for the uh, beans and corn yeah for sure so i was i'm based in guelph um and we're kind of in that goldilocks zone so you know we've had the the optimal moisture we'll say all season not too much not too little you know, um i think the biggest thing across eastern canada is the the amount of overcast days that we've had and and most of that listen to this show and, and other podcasts here on, on real agriculture whether it's from the smoke or whether it's from just the overcast days, you know, they're calling for four or five days of nice sunny weather this past weekend. And we maybe came, had a, maybe an hour of sunshine today. So I think that's really probably gonna hurt the overall maturity of the crop. Um, we still have a ways to go. We had three hot days last week that did help, but uh, but yeah, we just need some, some heat and some sun, more so the sun just to finish this corn crop off. So we're now we're mid September almost this week. Um, usually at the farm show, there's a lot of people cutting silage. There's maybe the odd grower, the odd field. Um, so um, dry bean burn downs are just starting um, very early stages, but uh, they still got a long way to go. So, but it's not the bin yet. Mother nature always surprises us. Still pretty optimistic and uh, 
we'll, uh, we'll, we always learn something every year, we'll say. Mm, that's a great way to look at it, Rob. That this will be a year we learn some lessons. <laughs> All right. Um, now, Kevin relates. So Kevin is out in the Fraser Valley, for those who don't know. Uh, corn silage harvest approximately 30% complete there, which is a solid two weeks ahead of normal. So, Patty, you, of course, said that, you know, in your area, good chunk of harvest done. It is a little early. Usually early harvest means not a great crop or a crop that faced a lot of challenges. Um, what is what is sort of what's left out there? What's still to go? Is it canola or is it still a mix? How's it looking? Um, there's some still some cereals to go, but um, as a rule, it's mostly canola. Um, you know, you get to that central part of Saskatchewan and they're probably almost ready to wrap up. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, they, I haven't seen the, they haven't, don't have the crop report out this week yet for last week. So last year we, or last week we were at 51%. So like I said, I'm sure we're well above that, like, cause some of those areas will be finishing, but you also have the South where they were later than normal. So those guys are kind of right where we are at. So um, that's kind of an anomaly for some of those areas as well. Mm -hmm. um, to Rob's point, lots to learn this year. Yeah. Um, and, and Jim, anytime you want to lay in here with, you know, and if it doesn't rain, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, yeah. So there you go. Jim is from a very dry part of uh, Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. All right. So the topic tonight, of course, fall weed control. Yeah, Jim is 95% done. Probably not a great thing. Um, let's sort of square this up, of course. We know how important it is to, to start clean, to, to make sure that that crop gets off to the best start. Um, and without, you know, a whole bunch of weeds for competition, all those sorts of great things. So, Patty, maybe I'll start with you. Why, when we're thinking about weed control, why does it really start in the fall? Um, well, for my area, you know, we start, we, we always have a pre-harvest on that cereal acre, pretty much guaranteed, unless we're going into that malt barley acre. So um, we are already starting to think about that well in before harvest happens. Um, because normally in the Northeast, we are not getting a lot of ample time to do a post-harvest app. So that's where pre-harvest is mainly our focus. Um, on that pulse acre though, I would say that one for sure is probably getting something else um, because we're having to use a diquat type of chemistry right now um, just for access to markets. Mm -hmm. So it's it's very important in our just, you know, weed spectrum that you're looking at, um, resistance management, nutrient usage, all kinds of different things that we have to consider going into that spring because we want the best start off for the spring that we can for that crop. And if we've got a mat of weeds that have overwintered, um, we're, we're off, we're not starting off very good to begin with. Mm -hmm. Now, Patty, on that note, in your area, you know, what percentage would you say make sure that they're, they're out for that pre-seed burn down? Is it pretty much across the board or is it still sort of hit miss depends on the grower? Well, I would hazard a guess that, you know, 85, 80 to 85 percent of growers have great intentions of everything gets a pass in the spring. But of course, Mother Nature always throws a kink into that. So um, anything they can get preloaded in the fall right now, um, you know, especially in the Northeast, you know, we could have a late spring, lots of snow to melt. We've got lots of different things we need to consider. So um, like I said, anything we get done in the fall. It's a great start to the spring for their, for these growers. So Rob, let's talk then, you know, as we shift our focus to the east, um, you know, in, in Patty's area, they're doing a, a pre-harvest pass. Definitely something that happens here as well in, in beans, or as you said, drying down edible beans. Um, so a year like this one where the crop is kind of late, is that causing a bit of concern for, for growers on when to when to make that pass? Not as much because that pass here, um, at least when we talk about pre-harvest, um, you know, that pass is based on the crop. So it's going to be a couple weeks behind it. You have to base it on the stage of the crop. So when the pods have really started to change color, just so we don't have that uh, product that gets translocated into the grain to keep that sample clean. So I would say for the most part, people are still OK. The biggest thing is, you know, a lot of winter wheat gets planted after dry beans and IP soybeans. So the, the wheat planting might be a little bit later, sorry, wheat peat, but, uh, but we still might be able to, to set that up. And I think with, uh, you know, now that there are some restrictions on glyphosate, 
we have to manage those weeds accordingly. So if you're only using some of the, something like an Aragon or an AIM or even a Reglone, they don't really have as, as great of activity on some of those perennial weeds like we would have on if glyphosate was still in that mix. So it's just a little bit of a, a different management strategy, but for the most part, growers are still basing it by the crop. There is some variability in the, in the crop as well. So uh, that, that also comes into play, but it's always better to, to spray on the later side than spraying too early, just to make sure that we don't get those residues in the grain. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's definitely a concern and probably, in, you know, increasing awareness about that concern. Um, and I do like, you know, we do have to sort of think about late season or fall weed control is exactly that, you know, yes, in, in it can be in crop, but it is um, often after we've taken that crop off and, and we are going to dig into some of those. Um, great. So we've got a, a question or perhaps uh, a statement from Ken. It's a myth that you need a frost before glyphosate for good permanent thistle control. And we are going to tackle sort of part of that question. But first, I want to talk, I want to hone in on, and I'm glad that he mentions thistle, the weeds that we're targeting in the fall. Because, of course, we're not going after everything. Um, it's just we have to understand our weed spectrum. So, Patty, what typically... What weeds are you typically targeting with either that pre-harvest or that post-harvest pass? Um, well, for pre-harvest, we're definitely after um, our Canada thistle and our dandelion. Um, sometimes you're, the south thistle will get some activity on them, but I find, you know, uh, post-harvest app on those is usually better. Um, so, yeah, we're actually having that discussion today about um, glyphosate app on Canada thistle and when's the right time to do it and um my biggest thing is if stuff's growing up from the Canada thistle it's not taking stuff down to the roots potentially so kind of look when it's kind of stagnant we haven't had that killing frost and it doesn't look like we'll have a killing frost here for probably three weeks maybe so that's a stretch for us too so normally we've had something in beginning of September so without that killing frost we can get some great activity on that Canada thistle but we're probably gonna have to wait a little bit yet especially if they cut anything off um you know in that barley field that they didn't do a pre-harvest on so mm -hmm. that's kind of where i'm at with the perennials um foxtail barley is a good time right now to do it as well um uh jay if you just want to go to that one slide six i had um uh i just had a picture of a field that we have around here and it just shows this is kind of an ideal ideal time to do um there we go uh, maybe it's slide five. I'll get it. <laughs> I don't know where okay, that's The one before that one, sorry. Right for me. <laughs> ah. They're all out it's of order. Asking. Yeah, I think so. There's one just with one field. It's just a single picture of a field. Of course it's out of order. Of course it is. That's fine. Uh, well, well, okay. Yeah, we'll wait for that. So, we got some good... Yeah. Uh, oh, there we go. Oh, here we go. Okay. There we go. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just had a picture. There's some foxtail barley. Um, you know, usually we've got some south thistle around those edges. Um, it's a great time when we've got some post-harvest um, apps that we can do to get some of those weeds that are, you know, usually around sloughs, low spots, field edges. We've got lots of drainage ditches around here as well. So great time to get in closer to those. We can use higher rates of you know, glyphosate at this time, or if you're adding something into the tank as well. Um, yeah, so it's it's a great time to control some of those weeds. Other things I'm looking at is some winter annuals. So stinkweed, cleavers, narrowly talks beard, storks bill. Um, yeah, so those are some of the ones that I'm focusing on. We also have to remember that some of these weed species as well, um, they can have multiple life cycles. So we can get some that are annual, but also winter annual. So Hawk's beard is one, stinkweed. Cleavers is probably my worst one. And depending if we get a dry fall, a cockle can be really bad around here as well. And that one, the tap roots on that can be, they can be four Massive. feet deep. Like it's great. Yeah. yeah. So the amount of nutrients and moisture they're pulling out of the soil is, is not good. It always blows my mind how there can be not it's not a lot of plant maybe but then the roots just go down so far um yeah. Dave, dr dave hooker has entered the chat killing frost is that below minus four i gotta wonder or i'm gonna ask is a killing frost always a set temperature is it temperature over time does it change 
west to east doesn't matter if it's been cold for a few days or if it suddenly happens uh rob i'll start with you what would you consider a killing frost well i think the uh, i don't know the technical term so i'll give a, a rob miller answer here but i always just <laughs> kind of wing it and go by how much uh frost is sitting on the leaves of the plant at uh, six o'clock in the morning when we wake up and if it looks uh, you always wait 72 hours or 48 hours to actually see the type of damage but I would say at least, uh, you know, I agree with Dave, probably a minus four for a certain amount of time. Or if it gets down to minus two, um, you have to actually have that dew point, the dew actually freeze on it. You just can't have cooler temperatures. I always like actually getting that that frost, like actually having the leaves turn white uh, to actually, you know, get the plant into more winter survival mode instead of just trying to deal with the cooler temperatures. So um, yeah, if, if you're minus two for several hours um, or even just, you know, minus four for a short period of time, but you really need to have the, the white um, icicles, let's say little tiny ice crystals on those, uh, those plants. And then you actually will start to see the, the symptomology on some of those uh, annual weeds. Or Patty, do you agree? <laughs> yes. Do you agree? Yeah. It's minus four yeah. For us, well, it, it can be, but it's more, it's got to be for an extended period of time as well. Because like we can drop down to minus four, you know, for a short period of time between five and six in the morning. And then the sun's already out and we're getting some heat. So that might not be our killing frost, right? But mm -hmm. in those situations around here, I would say that um, when we get that killing frost, we've had some cool weather up to that. Um, and then it just, plants are starting to harden off themselves, the weeds. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave asks, is cleaver is an annual, why bother with a herbicide in the fall? Now, I'll, I will say, uh, Dr. Dave's here in Ontario, Patty. Uh, cleavers, I got to say, I swear that cleavers are just a different beast in the West. And I know here, yeah. technically, there are some cleavers, but there's also bed straw. I think it's bed straw that looks just like cleavers, but it's not sticky. So are, are cleavers one of the ones that can overwinter or change their they can germinate in the fall, they can germinate in the spring. Do they change um, when they grow? Well, the problem we have with them some years is that they will overwinter. And you, mm. so you go out there and you think you only got maybe one, two oral cleavers because they're just starting from, they're just germinating. And you flip open or flip underneath the straw and you've got a massive cleaver and she's green as grass. So we're dealing with that. So if we can get control of those prior to... Um, prior to winter, um, we need to do that. Mm. It brings up so many other questions, but but before I get to some of those, I do wanna go, um, and Ray says about with a killing frost, it changes with the crop. See, but we're talking about two different things. What's a killing frost in the spring is very different than what's a killing frost in the fall because we're dealing with potentially very different species that we're actually trying to kill. Um, but good point, well, to both of you about, you know, that we're talking about trying to get these plants to go from actively growing up to starting to think about i need to prepare for winter so um so jay if you could queue up we're gonna go i want to go to clip two it's with uh, mr kenny Kura, which many of you will know um that talks a little bit about that nip of frost talks about uh timing of our herbicide spray um and brings up a couple things that i want to talk about after this so producer jay if you would <laughs> Let's talk about that window, when it closes, when should we winterize the sprayer, but, and, and with that, how late should we go? Are there opportunities late? Yeah, there, there are opportunities late, and again, Mike Cowborough has some excellent data. I, I mentioned that, you know, these, these weeds right now are capturing today's sunlight here in late September. They're driving photosynthate nutrients to the roots, and we're sending the herbicide along for the ride. What's really interesting is, is a weed species like perennial sow thistle, for example, you can increase, according to, to Mike's data, you can increase control by as much as 20% by spraying after it gets nipped by the first frost. Usually the first frost has been our cue to winterize the sprayer and put it away in the shed, right? But you know, if I can get a 20% increase in control on a real problem weed that we have in a lot of Ontario's fields by waiting until after frost, uh, great time. As always with a frost application, we kind of want to go another 48 hours frost free to let that plant recover right. and its metabolism to get going so we can actually get the herbicide into it. But that first frost might provide an excellent opportunity. Uh, what I would also say to growers is, you know, these are slower modes of action too. 
So, you know, the response, we're used to a lot of fast acting herbicides in the spring, but your, your activity in the fall is gonna be a little bit slower. For growers that want to do tillage, I would suggest you wait at least two weeks so that that chemistry translocates to the roots and actually has activity on the weed. And even for, for you know, applicators, if they go out and do this weed control pass late, you may not see a lot of activity on the weed after two weeks visually compared to what we're used to with spring weed control in the longer days of the year. But trust me, when you come back in the spring, that weed's full of herbicide. The sun in the spring is going to kickstart that weed to try to grow and it's gonna have some difficulty. Right. Our sponsors for The Agronomists are Adama Canada, The Canola School, and Enlist E3 from Corteva. Looking for high yields and clean fields? Choose Enlist E3 Soybeans. Part of the Enlist Weed Control System, Enlist E3 Soybeans help you control tough weeds, providing herbicide choice and tank mix flexibility. Enlist E3 Soybeans, the best in beans, period. I'm listening to myself in those ads and there are certain words that are very hard to say in succession at times. Um, also, I got a new fancy camera, everybody. And when I hand talk, it actually activates the hand signals and then it changes where it's looking. So welcome to live. Um, okay, there's a few things in, uh, in Ken's video I wanna talk about. Um, and uh, one of them was regrowth. And Jason, you mentioned it just before we went to that clip is thinking about the stage of the perennial weed. We need enough regrowth after harvest to take in the herbicide. So, so Patty, I'll start with you. If we're thinking about some of those, um, as you mentioned, some of those fall weeds, let's say we've got that cold, cold temperature or a few cool days, maybe we've got that bit of frost. Um, what is too late? Like how warm is warm enough to make sure that that plant is actually gonna take in some of that herbicide and we're gonna get an effective kill? Well, we still, we need some growth. So if the plants have totally like browned off from a frost or, you know, it's gotten too cold, then there's no plant material for that chemistry to translocate down to those roots or the crown of the plant. So that's where you have to watch like what's going on. Um, when you're doing just a straight glyphosate app that, you know, you can pretty much do that, you know, as it's, as you get those killing frosts or just those first few days after that. Um, I do like to wait till it does warm up during the day if you possibly can. You just get better activity through that plant and it's moving it a little bit better than it does if it stays cold and, you know, you get into where the temperature just keeps dropping. So there's really no great time. It's kind of what Mother Nature kind of deals you. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, that could be end of September or it could be early November, depending on what the weather does. So yeah. is a warm day, let's say it's sunny and it's only five, six degrees. If depending on the species, is that enough? That's perfect. Yeah. Okay. I shall order yeah. that for mid October yeah. for you. Uh, yeah. And even <laughs> like, even plus one, like if we're still dealing really? with, um, you know, it's gotten a little bit cool at night, but we're still not that killing frost. And if we still got some plus temperatures, um, you know, if the guy's going to can wait till later in the afternoon and we still got some sunlight, I'm okay with that too. It, we usually get a really good kill at that time too. So Rob, let's hope that we're not having that till like December-ish, but like, yeah. let's say, <laughs> I, hey, every once in a while we get that. We luck out. We have a really <laughs> nice week. Um, but, but fall in Ontario is interesting because we do have, or we can get a very open, very long fall where we do have a lot of options, but we are, are we're also quite busy usually with harvest for a lot of that time with corn, whatever. How do we, how do we know when it's too late? What are you seeing as far as your growers as how late they're going in with some of their fall wheat control? Yeah. So I agree with Patty and, and Jason that we always want to have a little bit of, uh, you know, green material there to take up the herbicide. I, I think it just depends on the wheat. Um, you know, something like South thistle. recent research has actually shown that it can, it's photoperiodic sensitive, it's alight sensitive. It can actually go dormant in that, you know, in that September timeframe. So if we're targeting something like a perennial South thistle, you know, once you start getting into October, it's actually too late that they'll actually start browning and, and dying off generally on their own. And so you go out there, you get spray your herbicide, you think it's great, uh, but it's just naturally dying because it's, um, 
um, because it's going dormant. And Mike Colbert did a really good presentation on that at the Ontario A conference last year, because uh, that's kind of new new research. Um, you know, it's much different than the Canada thistle, like we said, um, that we need that frost for. But um, maybe producer Jay, if you actually pull up the first slide that I have there, it's a picture of uh, a dandelion field, and this is a really nice example that we like to like to tell people. So you know, usually we want to have it above above average temperatures. Um, you know that four, even six degree sunny day, even after a light frost, if as long as it hits eight degrees Celsius that day after a light frost, you can actually go out and spray that day. Um, you actually, did, you did get warm enough temperatures, but this particular photo was actually, uh, the field was sprayed in mid November and the boom actually froze at the time of application. So that's the, just shows you the time, uh, you know, the pressure that this grower is dealing with, but it was a beautiful check strip because there was a nice, uh, you know, 15 foot swath through it, the entire field. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that field is just full of dandelions. So you can just see the value of that, uh, that fall application on something right. like a, a, a dandelion for sure. So that's where we still have a lot of time, um, you know, don't winterize the sprayer yet. Once it consistently starts go below freezing, the ground starts to freeze, you know, the application window is by far over, uh, the sprayer is probably winterized by then, but we still have, you know, in some regions, at least till end of October, first part of November, depending on the fall, depending on the weed spectrum and, and don't, uh, don't park the sprayer just yet because, uh, once you start doing fall weed control, especially on these tough to control weeds, you're sold. It's actually the, the toughest part is to actually, you know, find the time, get out there, and spray or get out there and control these weeds, manage these weeds. But once you leave an untreated check like this, you know, it's going to be slow. It's not going to look like you sprayed, but you will be sold and you'll be convinced to do it year after year after year. So, and Dr. Hucker brings up a good point that he's astounded at the level of dandelion control with a low rate of glyphosate in November. So I guess further to that point, Rob, like some of the weed spectrum that we're trying to target, the absolute best with potentially either an affordable option or a lower rate option is going to be in the fall. You just have to get out there then. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So if you actually skip to slide three, uh, Jay, um, this is, this is a nice one that I, again, from Mike Cobra that he presented at uh, Southwest Ag Conference in 2018, basically comparing a fall applied versus spring applied. Um, it's actually from uh, Dr. Rennie Van Acker and, and um, mm -hmm. from 2006. You can actually see, this is looking at the number of dandelion rosettes. You get 30% better activity of that dandelion using the exact same rate of glyphosate. So it's gonna cost you the same amount, you know, with glyphosate and the application cost, but 30% better control. And glyphosate or dandelions is one of those weeds that is very uh, rate responsive to, to glyphosate. Um, what, there is a big difference between a a 1x or a 1 liter per acre rate of, a, of a, the old standard formulation versus a 2 liter uh, equivalent. And that's where we saw a lot more dandelions this spring in Ontario. And I think last year with a lot of our, the glyphosate prices were much higher than what they uh, historically were. So growers were actually cutting back on the rates of glyphosate or, you know, skipping that fall application and using lower rates. So we're actually controlling some of the smaller weeds, the smaller perennial weeds, but the great big large ones we weren't controlling. Um, so that's where, you know, pick the rate of glyphosate that's required. Definitely add that tank mix partner in there. If you are dealing with some form of resistance, it's just good stewardship. And you know, make sure you time it accordingly and uh, use the proper rates. It's probably the main take home. Mm -hmm. I would like to point out uh, that work I believe was done in Manitoba because I happen to know the HACO that is uh, in those Van Acker and Van Acker was still at the University of Manitoba at that time, I believe. Uh, someone could probably tell me if I'm wrong, uh, but I'm pretty sure that was. So there you go. Oh, West, look at it, it's all coming full circle, West and East together. Um, all right, so, so uh, Jim made a point earlier about five foot kosher. And all he wrote was five foot kosher exclamation mark question. Patty, what in the heck do we do with gigantic weeds like kosher? Do we ignore them in the fall? Like what well, should we be doing? There's there's so many thoughts on that just because most of them now we're getting resist multiple group resistance mm -hmm. to that kosher. Um, so we almost have to have like, it needs an integrated approach. So if we can get a pre on it, in crop or sorry pre-seed in crop 
pre-harvest and then a post-harvest. And that may also include we're doing something maybe we don't want to do. Maybe we're tilling some of those areas or we're mowing them. Right? Like, I know you guys hate I like hearing mowing. tillage. I like mowing, Patty. So, it's okay. Rob but, loves tillage. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so, with the yeah. kosher, it, it was terrible this year. We've had right. lots of pulse acres. We didn't get a good pre-seed, um, pre-emergent control on those that kosher. And there's nothing to take care of it in crops. So we have these kosher plants that are huge. So, you know, if they've knocked them down, if there's any regrowth, great time to go with 240 on those you know my rule of thumb is prior to september 15th you could pretty much go with 240 and no recropping um you know at that four to six ounce rate anything higher than that then you need to reconsider whether you're recropping to certain species yeah so i'm glad you brought up mowing because certainly and i know farmer jim desperately wants to get livestock and should start silaging something um and i'm absolutely kidding but um for some of these very tough to kill weeds or very large weeds some form of mechanical control to avoid seed set or something like that might actually especially in patches or the lines yeah. that kosher like to leave as it rolls along might actually be useful um or or maybe is the only option uh for sure now i want to talk about multi-resistant weeds in a second rob with you as well but jim also mentioned that winterizing the sprayer is cheap so if you do it too soon you can totally bring it out do it again it's not that expensive if you're going to get those kind of results it's well worth uh taking it out once again, and I completely agree there, Farmer Jim. Um, and Ray says, five foot kosher, just send in the robot pickers. Um, I think that's most people's kids mm -hmm. at this point. That's what we can afford. Uh, so yeah, there you go. Now, but that does bring up, Rob, when I think about, okay, even the idea of like physically removing them. So, okay, let's, mo let's mow them. Um, or depending on what kind of weed we might, if it's something like Palmer Amaranth that was found either in Ontario now or in Southern Manitoba, we're literally pulling out the weed um, and you know, trying to contain any seeds that might fall, that sort of stuff. Rob, you've got a great image of that shows how innovative we can be about capturing some of these seeds, not necessarily to keep them out of the field, maybe just to measure them, maybe as an example. Uh, but uh, producer Jay, if you could bring up, this is gonna be trademarked, I'm sure, as the new scouting tool uh, with the umbrella, uh, yeah, which number is it, Rob? Minute. There yeah. it is, there we go, common ragweed, Okay, so walk me through what's going on here, because I think this is brilliant. Yeah, so this is actually from your area, Lindsay, in eastern Ontario in the Ottawa Valley. So this actually is a nice picture from uh, Tega Chalette, who works as tech service uh, in Ontario. And uh, this is actually group 14 resistant common ragweed. And we're actually getting a lot more testing for this. And uh, it's actually surprising how quickly this is spreading across the province of Ontario, both uh, in the Ottawa Valley and especially down in Essex and, and Lambton. So believe it or not, that's actually a soybean field that the umbrella is sitting in. Um, it's been IP soybeans for numbers, numerous uh, years in a row. And, uh, you know, they noticed that the, the ragweed wasn't dying. So this is was a very innovative way that uh, Tagger was using to collect some weed seeds by flipping the umbrella upside down and just kind of shaking them in there. And, and then you can easily funnel that into your uh, your paper bag to, in order to get it tested. So I think that the main take home here is if you're concerned on some weeds that are escaping, whether it's the fall burn down or something throughout the season, or you start to see those, you know, those pig weeds that start to look, you know, a little bit wonky, a little bit different, or, um, you know, definitely get them tested. Number one, collect some of the seed. We can ship them to the University of Guelph. We can also do some of the genetic testing with plant material. Uh, you want to make sure you collect that information now because that will set yourself up for success the next season. You know, what are some of your programs? What kind of uh, integrated pest management approach do you have to take in order to, uh, to do that? So collect the seed, collect the plant material, and definitely uh, get more information. And don't let a lot of these resistant annual weeds go to seed. That's probably the, the biggest thing. Look at that field and yeah. imagine the weed seed return in just one year in that entire field. So I got it. Like, I, I mean, I don't know whose field it is. And I've tried to establish a couple um, forage fields that probably looked a little like this at one point. Um, but we cut it then. And then, it you know, it doesn't look so bad. But I mean, this doesn't happen overnight either. 
right? As, as prolific yeah. as some of these weeds are, we usually start with a patch. It maybe grows from there. Um, but also I do think this means great idea, bring an umbrella and use it to collect seed. Um, so good point though, Rob, about sort of that, that thinking ahead and testing something that's questionable. That's definitely a big thing that comes up. Um, more and more these days is that if something you know doesn't seem like a sprayer mist or um, is a pesky patch that just won't die uh, probably something to dig into further now two questions that have come in that are sort of related so one is um herbicide mixes for post harvest so we still i think um you know yes we're going to use glyphosate uh i have asked the question before on this show are the days of just glyphosate alone long gone or can we still do that in certain situations um and then the the second question we're going to ask to this is we're going to talk about uh fall applied with residual but let's just talk um tank mix in the fall patty do you have a favorite and why um tank mix in the fall post harvest um there's quite a few different options so um you can go in with um you know a florazam florazolam based product um but that needs a later up because you don't want that to activate prior to um prior to winter so that's kind of your last thing you're going to do in the fall before you winterize the sprayer that's kind of my favorite um other than that i'm i'm using like residual herbicides um okay. something that's gonna need some moisture to activate um snow melt is great for that so that's kind of where I'm at because like lots of times I said, we don't get that opportunity. So anytime we can get something on right now, you know, a, a residual products where, where we're going to go to. Mm -hmm. Now, Rob, we talk about, um, and we've done this on the soybean school and like these talking about herbicide layering, right? So we talk about, and you've mentioned it before, you know, all the different times you can be going after some of these weeds. Um, what are your thoughts on some of these fall applied uh, residuals? in there with their fit in Ontario? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I think it, number one, is depends on the weed spectrum, um, you know, and the time. Uh, there's a difference between spraying and the fall, you know, the fall's a long time in Ontario. Um, you know, we could say you're spraying today is fall applied because now we're into September, even though it's, it's uh, you know, we haven't hit the mm -hmm. uh, fall solstice yet. Um, but we can go all the way up till you know, even sometimes middle of December. So I always look at the chickweed as that indicator weed because it is always the one that tends to continue to germinate as well. Um, but if you're going after some of the some residual weeds, it all depends on the crop that you're planning to grow next spring. You definitely want to have a flexible follow crop. Really only see the benefit to adding some, having some longer residual, the higher rates, say, you know, September timeframe, you don't need as much residual um, if you're doing the fall weed control in Ontario if you're spraying, you know, in November 1st, let's say end of October, because you're not going to get a whole lot of weed flushes. You might see some, you're still, if, especially if you get some nice warmer conditions. I think the, the real benefit we would see is if you're going after something like a bluegrass, um, and annual bluegrass would probably be the main one that we nice, that we'd like to see that, uh, that residual aspect uh, for that year. And, but you also want to make sure that you have some flexible follow crop the next year. So I think it's a, it's a new practice that's coming as we start to see some of these weed shifts based on, you know, the conventional crops that we're using, um, you know, more, maybe more tillage, maybe some more high speed discs, um, as we adjust or as we change our agriculture practices, we're starting to see, you know, mother nature adapt as well. And we're starting to see a lot of these weeds shift. So I think it really depends on, on the weed spectrum there and, and what crop and what options you have in that crop the following year as well. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're trying to deal with some yeah. resistant weeds. Yeah. Patty, you mentioned that there's pulses out your way. So anyone in a pulse area knows all about recropping <laughs> um, and just how yeah. sensitive they can be. So it's always top of mind. Uh, you bring up yeah. a good point though, Rob, in that in that discussion about, uh, you know, mother nature adapts as well, right? So if we're always in an annual routine, annual crops, the same time of spring every year, whether you like it or not, you're actually selecting for weeds that also thrive under that system right so mm -hmm. you know this idea of going in in the fall yes target certain weeds but it also is you're adding that sort of that other level um or adding that other step that sort of mixes things up a little bit changes things up now um 
Patty, what about residuals in the spring? Is there a lot, is there or more interest maybe in residual products in the spring? Well, I think the problem sometimes in the spring is we're not always guaranteed we get enough moisture to activate some of those residual products. So lots of them on label now, you can do them in the fall. And for us this year, like I would say we have two different po or like post harvest times. So we've got our early fall where like a 240 fits into that or, you know, glyphosate and 240 or something else, um, maybe contact herbicide. And then later fall, then we're going into those residual products, you know, something that stays in the soil, doesn't activate, doesn't move, doesn't go anywhere. And it's ready as a pre-emerge to take care of any, of any volunteer cereals in some, in some cases, um, volunteer canola in other cases. Um, so that's kind of where, you know, we're targeting if we have the time to do them. Mm -hmm. Those like 14, 15, 27, We've got, you know, the old trifluralins. We can be using those now too. Mm -hmm. Now, Rob, obviously a, a spring here in Ontario, spring residual, much more common. Um, and I, I'm going to snicker only a little that we complain about when it's dry, do they activate? We don't know what dry is, Rob Miller. We when, you know. <laughs> um, in comparison. So, but, but similar question. I know we're talking fall weed control, but it, we do use residual product, products, of course, in the spring, and they still do deliver usually, even in a dry bias, we'll call it. We won't call it a dry year, but maybe a dry bias for this area. Um, so is that part of your package for the most part, um, adding those layers? Yeah, absolutely. Especially if it is in, you know, corn, soybeans, we, we have enough resistant weeds in Ontario, whether it's group two, annual weeds, group five, you know, nine, it's, it's not just the, the water hemp flea bane discussion anymore. You know, lamb's quarters is one of the most challenging weeds to control. Um, you know, something like a water hemp will germinate throughout the season. And usually it's after that tillage pass. Uh, Mike Shriver has done some work with uh, Peter Sikama, and we've actually seen water hemp germinate the end of September, still set seed two weeks later. So like we said earlier, Mother Nature has a way to adapt. It's not going to produce, you know, 100,000 seeds, but it's still going to grow a couple inches and set seed. That's, that's what a plant wants to do, right? It just wants to reproduce. Every plant that's there, um, well, it just wants to reproduce. And, and every time you do that, you have to, you know, it, it starts to put those weed seed uh, it back into the, the seed bank. So I, I think that's where it's, it's pretty much mandatory now in Ontario. I think if you want to grow high yield potential crops, um, you, you have to use a soil applied residual herbicide. And especially if you have some of these problem weeds, you have to look at residuals at planting as well as in crop and then manage those weeds as part of your rotation. So if you have wheat in your rotation, lamb's quarters is your biggest, biggest issue. You should not have any lamb's quarters going to seed right now in your wheat stubble. Um, you know, and I think one thing that we, we haven't talked about yet is probably cover crops, right? So, you know, yeah. I'm using cereal rye, um, using oats, um, whether it's forage oats or even just cover crop, that's also a means of, of weed control. Mother nature doesn't like bare soil. And I know it, it doesn't work as much in Western Canada, but uh, in Eastern Canada, we, you know, crop canopy is, is your best means of weed control. And in order to mm -hmm. prevent some of those weeds from, uh, from germinating. I think we just need to start figuring out how to use water hemp. Like maybe it's delicious in a salad. Yep. I don't know. Um, yep. Okay. So just quickly, because yes, we haven't talked, uh, we'll talk a bit about cover crops a little, but I really, I do want to talk a bit about tillage as well and, uh, and fall temps. Uh, but let's just, we'll have our last uh, throw to our sponsors for tonight's show. And then we'll get into these last topics uh, right after this. Our sponsors for The Agronomist are Adama Canada, Enlist D3 from Corteva and the Canola School. From preceding cedar setup and checks to pest ID and advice on nutrient management decisions to tips on determining swath timing, Real Agriculture's Canola School is a video series that tackles every facet of the canola growing season in an engaging and informative format. The Canola School is made possible through sponsorship by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Learn more at canolaschool.com. dance too much okay so we've got our last our last part of the show here uh so if there are any more questions please uh pop them into the chat uh as we sort of wind down uh, our time for tonight um so uh i do want to talk a little bit about tillage now 
Patty, when we think Saskatchewan, we think zero till. That's not always the case necessarily. And certainly um, in some areas, tillage is still uh, more common than in others. For your area anyway, is tillage still part of the cropping system? And is it for seedbed prep or are we targeting weeds? Um, so it's a combination. So we are zero till in the spring for the most part, I would say. But the pro tills and those uh, vertical tillage has taken off in the last five to seven years, probably five years. Um, that's more when guys were, you know, we had a lot of trash or, you know, we had to manage that debris that was left over. That was a way to do that. You know, they wanted to get some weeds germinating so they could, some of those annual volunteers, whatever was out in the field, getting those to germinate so they could go, you know, the killing frost would take care of those, hopefully. Um, and then just those, you know, those low spots are usually dry in the fall. Let's get those looked after, you know, headlands, getting all that looked after. So tillage has kind of come back to play a role, but we've also got burnt some years when we haven't got a lot of snow cover and the moisture wasn't great in the spring. You could tell a field that was pro tilled versus one that had only got a heavy harrow in the fall. So mm -hmm. guys are kind of weighing their options. You know, is it necessary or can I just get away with a heavy harrow? Mm -hmm. And and what about when when we think specifically about let's say we've done a herbicide pass, um, would those fields potentially be worked? I guess Ken's point in the earlier video, you know, if you're going to spray, you need that herbicide to work before you're working up those fields. You need to wait that time. Are those used in conjunction or that's not necessarily the goal? No, that would be the goal because we don't have enough time um, for, yeah. you know, for that chemistry to have translocated through the plant by the time they can go and vertical till it again. So yeah. in, in a normal year, this is kind of an anomaly. So they probably, if they right. sprayed right away, they would be able to still vertical they till it, time. you know, before Thanksgiving. Yeah, right. It's a yeah, nice fall. It's really nice, guys. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dr. Dave Hooker says, I find that many do not realize that green weeds can have viable seed. Um, yeah. So, and, and apparently that water hemp can produce seed that quickly. Uh, so these are things we do have to think about when we think about trying to, um, trying to minimize the weed seed return, uh, for sure. Now, Rob, certainly more tillage happens in Ontario. It breaks my heart, but whatevs. Um, how reliable let's take herbicides out if you're using fall tillage as weed control how reliable is it give it to me straight i guess it depends on what's your definition of tillage so it that's depends. the richie washer answer so it's oh. you know some people look at these high speed discs as tillage right so that's a way to maybe incorporate some residue to try to help it break down a little bit earlier but they're by no means a method of weed control. Um, they just basically cover up weeds, especially a lot of these annual weeds, or sorry, the perennial weeds like the, the dandelions, they just cover them up and, and piss them off even that much more. So um, even if it is something like a south perennial south thistle that has a lot of rhizomes, you chop up some of those rhizomes, you actually turn one perennial south thistle plant into maybe two or three or even more. So uh, by doing some of that. So I think it all depends on the the weed species present a year like this, where we've actually been wetter than normal, the soil is working up a little bit clumpier, right? Or people haven't, it hasn't been dry enough to actually do any form of tillage. So we're probably seeing a lot more delay in that tillage pass. Um, and it's actually working up in bigger clumps. So when it's working up in a bigger clump, you know, the, the weeds are still growing, right? You just kind of shifted that clump fine. and moved it over. So, um, yeah. so it depends on the weeds and you want to get out there a little bit earlier. Um, but sometimes with tillage, you know, if you're using like, um, like a, a disc ripper or something like that, if you do it too early, then weeds start to germinate afterwards, like dandelions, then you're relying on tillage in the spring to take them out. Then you're already setting yourself back because mm -hmm. um, you're not going to take out some of those larger weeds. So I would say if we couldn't rely on any type of herbicides or cover crops, any other means that we control, um, timely tillage on those problem weeds is very important. And if it is something like a 2,4-D, you got to kind of, or sorry, a, a wild carrot that's resistant to 2,4-D yeah. material, you actually have to maybe cut the weed, cut that large taproot versus just 
you know, moving the soil around it, moving it up mm -hmm. and, and displacing it. So. so, and so this is my, I guess, because, and I'm going to get hate mail and bring it on. It's fine. Uh, because there's always somebody out there who will tell me, you know, oh, maybe, you know, somebody else can't get, get a good kill with discs or somebody else can't, mm -hmm. but I can. Um, but dandelion and and things like a wild carrot whatever they have incredibly large roots especially mm -hmm. if they're a big plant if they've been there if they're the second year or whatever that you know just moving them over a little is not going to kill them you really need to do some yeah. aggressive tillage to actually get yeah. there right so and then what's the cost of doing that aggressive tillage so warren schneckenberger farmer schneck has got a great question i've struggled with it and warren i'm going to ask a question before i ask the panel i've been struggling with dandelion and soybean stubble going into corn what recommendations for fall application post-harvest uh, mid-october in eastern ontario so i'm going to ask the warren is this all you've done is taking the beans off and you've done nothing else on the field i do want to know if there's been any sort of if that's like the next pass um and there you go so uh and there was another question and i think it's well from real agriculture which is either sean or kara it's always a surprise i'm not sure on do we need uh what's the minimum daytime temps we need for herbicide to work so patty you mentioned you know as long as the day has warmed up into those positive temps um that that it should work but are we worried about herbicide efficacy based on temperature um you definitely like it's more of a concern in the spring i find than yeah. in the fall um just because the way the plant like for some of those weeds that we're targeting so thistle um like canada thistle it's moving canada thistle down they're moving it down to the roots right so that's a natural progression so it's not as critical i think for temperatures at this time of year versus in spring when we're trying to get really good weed control. Um, like I said, my general rule of thumb is that four to eight degrees. Um, if you get it like, you know, minus three, minus five frost, that's a, you know, extended period at night, then you need those warmer temperatures during the day. So like five to eight degrees for a couple hours, then you go and spray. Done. Okay. All right. Let's bring it back to let's solve Warren's problem. Um, he's struggling with dandelions and soybean stubble going into corn. Warren, so he says, possibly strip till. I'm going to ask Warren, what have you done so far? But Rob, while he's answering that question, because maybe he's a slow typer, I don't know, we'll find out. <laughs> what would be your recommendation? So going into corn, dandelion in the fall. Yeah, so I agree with Patty, you know, 100%. You have to wait for the cooler temperatures, triggers it to go to fall survival. Um, herbicides are just along for the ride, right? So if that energy of nutrients is going down to the roots, that's where we get better kill. If it's a large field of dandelions, larger, you know, basketball size of dandelions, it's going to take a couple of years to, to manage it. And, you know, one fall application isn't going to get 100% weed control by any means. So it's going to be that multi-year progress. Um, depending on what cover crops and everything you want to use, strip till, probably two liters of glyphosate of the old standard formulation or 1.3 liters. And if it is, you know, larger um, basketball size dandelions, let's say. So the glyphosate label actually states if it's above 15 centimeters, then you have to use higher rates. And then add in that second additional mode of action. So in strip till, one of the biggest risks and even, you know, Warren, if it's not in your area yet, it's probably, you know, neighboring communities is Canada flea bane. So you always want to add in something there. So I like using, uh, a product like the Stink, the later in the later into October, it's say this year, it might be a little bit more delayed to get the beans off. Uh, a glyphosate plus distinct. If we have received a frost, then I like adding some adjuvants. We tend to get a little bit better activity on some of the adjuvants, so adding in like a merge or adding in like a non-ionic and and twenty percent nitrogen tend to get better activity. It won't look like you sprayed it in the fall. It won't even touch it. Like you know. You'll go out there a month later, they're still going to be kind of twisted up. You'd, uh, but I guarantee you, if you leave a small untreated check, uh, preferably towards the back of the farm, you'll be able to see that check strip for the next couple of years. Yeah. Leave it near the neighbors. No, wait, not okay. near the neighbors. <laughs> yeah. Not. So, yeah. and if you are, point, doing, I, I, yeah. I will say, if you are doing any fall strips, minimum seven days, um, if you can, you know, with strip till, you always want to go on soil conditions too. So it's, it's a little bit more challenging, but the longer you wait, the better it's going to be. So, and there really is only one rated distinct that we can use there. So. Okay. Same rate. Patty, anything, 
Yeah, anything, I mean, not necessarily growing soybeans and corn, but for problem dandelions, anything uh, you would do differently in Saskatchewan? Uh, lots of glyphosate. That's why at the pre-harvest, you know, we're limited to what we can put down. So if you've got dandelion issues, that's when you need to do a post-harvest. And that's where we get way better control of them with those higher rates of glyphosate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Patty brings uh, up a good yeah. point because uh, our distinct rates are different Eastern versus Western Canada. So yeah. Uh, yeah. for our Western uh, Canadian listers, uh, definitely don't use distinct uh, that late into the fall. So. I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> there's a limit. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Patty. So, and we should, yeah. we should state for the record on the show every once in a while, um, certain products have different names, East and West. So I think about Aragon yeah. yes. and heat. It's heat and in heat. the West, Aragon. Yeah, Aragon in the East. Uh, in the east. And please, yes, uh, check your own labels for and check <laughs> with your agronomist because there are a few products uh, that mm -hmm. do have different labels uh, in Ontario versus uh, the West. So yes, it's not just that conditions are different. We do actually have some rules that are slightly different. Uh, so please take that into account as well. Um, so Jason's got a, a good question. I think this is what you mean. Uh, Jason, but let me know. Um, we are talking about certain weeds that obviously we get better kill in the fall or maybe the best kill in the fall, but we can't take care of everything in the fall. There's still going to be those spring annuals. There's still going to be, you know, late flushing weeds, those sorts of things. But I, I guess, you know, he, he says, let's look at fall uh, herbicides for control of next year's weeds. There's really only some that we can really get the jump on, right, Patty? Like we're, we're talking about the thistle, south thistle, canna thistle, dandelions, the perennials, or maybe some of those overwintering pesky things. We can't really control everything. No, and you, we can't. So some of the ones we're targeting right now would be like, you're targeting those thistles and things like that. And you're going to have your annuals or your, volu your volunteer cereals, your volunteer canola that's coming through in the spring. So that's where those pre-emerge ones that are applied late fall help you out. Um, you know, then as the snow melts, as things get warming up in that soil, we get some microbial activity. Those ones start to work, you know, when you've got less volunteers, so you can maybe not have to make that pass in the spring. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a benefit as well, I find. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Rob, to your point, we do have potentially a very long open fall there's certainly parts of Ontario that, you know, don't have a lot of winter kill. I mean, how many times have we had cover crop oats that we were like, oh, winter will take care of them. And they don't. Yeah. Uh, they don't die. So we still, red so we clover. have sort of an opposite <laughs> red clover. We have the opposite problem that, you know, there are things we think winter should take care of and they, and it doesn't. Um, and uh, those aren't always bad winters to go through, Patty. I'll, I'll be honest. I'm yeah. having <laughs> I would know minus 40. Yeah, ex <laughs> yeah exactly. All the time. Sorry about yeah. that. Um, yeah. I also want to share. Oh, go ahead, Rob. Yeah, I was just going to, you know, expand on Patty's comment. We always say that, you know, apply herbicides to small actively growing weeds. It's the exact same thing for perennial weeds and winter annuals, right? They're much smaller, uh, much yeah. easier to control in the, in the fall. And that's, that's basically the same concept. So. Mm -hmm. And I do want to mention, because dandelion is a, a personal favorite foe of mine, dandelion is tricky because it does, it does overwinter, it is a perennial, but it's, it puts out seed and those seeds grow, like it grows at two different times a year. So you get, right, the, the, the one that overwintered will give you seed in the spring, those then germinate in the fall. So to your point, Rob, you're going after those new seedlings as well. But if, you're, if your main target is those huge ones, then you're going to have a bit of, bit of a different plan of attack and it's probably going to take a couple years. Um, I did want to note, Jim Hale gave a shout out to the Noble Blade. And Patty, I don't know if you know what this is. Rob, I'm going to guess you don't because I had, I don't think I'd ever even seen it, but uh, Sean Haney pulled, I don't know if he can share it in the comments. <laughs> we'll maybe drop it in the post. Uh, but Noble Fert is not that far. It is a very interesting looking piece of equipment. And of course, Jim would know what this looks like. So I, I'm going to tell everyone in the audience, Google the Noble Blade and see what you think on what that's going to do for weed control. Um, and, and there you go. So, um, oh, okay. So good, good question here, Kevin. And maybe we'll wrap up on this as we rapidly run out of time here. Um, Patty has alluded to it a few times. Uh, we know that herbicides, of course, get metabolized. They need water and they need warm temperatures in order to break down in the soil. So we do worry um, at times on 
adding a, a herbicide of a particular kind and then how much moisture and temperature we get after that. Um, and so uh, are there, Kevin asked, now remember he's where it's warm and wet, usually, not this year. Uh, can any of these fall applied herbicides limit you on what you can grow in the following years? So Patty, what are your biggest sort of caveats when using a fall applied? Um, that's where, that's where you potentially run into trouble. So if you're not really sure what your rotation potentially could be due to crop prices, um, you know, a product like Focus, you're limited on where you can use that just kind of for wheat. Some of those other ones, Authority, you know, you have some freedom with that one. Um, and then uh, some of the, like, you have to really worry about recropping to pulses with some of those. So that would be my caveat. You just have to make sure that you know what you're using. Um, to, like I said, some of the earlier ones that are just contact or just translocating through the plant, those ones are fine to use up until kind of the middle of September here. Um, but that would be the caution is, you know, you kind of, for those acres, you kind of have to have a set plan and that's not changing. Mm -hmm. Rob, what are the biggest uh, red flags or worries for you? I think probably the, the horticulture crops. Um, you know, we tend to use yeah. more of the group four products in the fall, so they have shorter in, uh, recrop intervals. Um, you know, always check the label. If the label says three months or, you know, 120 days or whatever, that means 120 days of non-frozen soil. Because like you said, Lindsay, we do need that, uh, those microbes to break it down. Um, but horticulture crops, uh, sugar beets are always uh, one as well. Um, you know, that they seem to be sensitive to everything. Um, so they're also a nice indicator crop. But um, for the most part, the, the, in general, the row crops are, are okay. I like that you called it an indicator crop. That's a really kind way of saying it's yeah. sensitive and it's going to die. Yeah, um, we we research really... that. We research yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it's a sugar beet. One key point I wanted to mention too was yes. make sure these guys are reading their, you have to read your label as well. Because some of these are, mm -hmm. you know, they need a harrow after, they don't need anything. Um, you know, you just spray and forget it. So just be cautious of what you're putting on your field and what you need to do after or even before you apply those products because you don't want to lots of these fall applied residual products are high dollar inputs so make sure you're using them the best to your ability so ask your agronomist ask the sales rep whoever you bought them from just to get the what you need to be doing with those products excellent point patty um and and exactly that uh, sometimes they're pricier you want to get the full use of them for sure um yes and uh jim hale informs me that they still make the noble blade in the states and i would like everyone to know including dr hooker says if you have one do you win a nobel prize um someone on the real agriculture team apparently has one on their farm so we are going to get photos and attach them we'll put them in the post of this over on realagriculture.com so everyone who doesn't know what we're talking about can figure it out um and ray echoes what patty said label 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 and yes as rob pointed out the labels are going to be different east and west as well for some of these products even if they have the same name um so please make sure that uh, we're checking that out we are out of time which is, has absolutely flown by so uh rob if you could um if you could have your growers do one thing on fall weed control this year what would be your your pretty please please everyone do this if you've never tr done it before try it leave it untreated and you will be sold next spring i like it patty what advice for your growers if you have a pulse acre going in next spring and you have time do some sort of residual product if you can on that acre um the ones yes. that you can use right now okay i like it well done team this has been so much fun um we're out of time this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Patty. Patty's first time on the show, everyone. Give her a round of applause. We need one of those buttons. Um, Rob, yeah, there you go. Rob, have so much fun at Outdoor Farm Show this week. Uh, when you get there, if there's fair weather on Thursday, anyone who sees them say hello. Um, as always, head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists uh, tomorrow. Let us know you watch the, the show. Get those CU credits. Thank you to our sponsors, Adama Canada and Listy3 and the Canola School. And of course, thank you to each and every one of you who joined us uh, in the chat. Really appreciate it. We'll see you next week. We're going to talk about what we can learn at Harvest about how we did on disease control. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>